many a union made who stood up to the bosses so staunch and unafraid. Molly Jackson, Mother Jones fought for a better way, but we'll sing of Fanny Sellins and remember her today. Fanny, after being shot in the back, was turned over and her skull was crushed. 
um, and there'll be more talk of that as we go down. I'm very honored the Battle Homestead Foundation, the, the union, the steel workers, the United Mine Workers, the, the LA Kiski Historical Society to be together for this very, very uh, important, I think, moving event to honor a great woman heroine of this area and somebody who is remembered because the community remembered, because Phil Murray remembered, because this community and Tony Somkowski, who had kept alive the memory of Fanny Sellins for at least 35 years that I know of, that he was holding events here virtually every year. Some of them were tiny, some of them were big, but he never forgot. Tony died this year and his Everybody said, well, Tony can't, he, he won't be too clear. And then he sat and talked for a half hour and told me exactly what he wanted. So <laughs> we have almost everything that he wanted. So we, this is very much an honor of him and of keeping this story alive. We've got some wonderful speakers. talked about Tony Slomkowski. I had a lot to say about I have a lot to say about Tony too, but uh, we'll talk about him all during the day, I think. He's here. He brought us good weather, even. Yes. Yeah, his spirit is here. And uh can you I didn't think so. Yeah, I'm not saying anything anyway. <laughs> yeah, this program is gonna be followed by uh, another program at the Union Hall. And, uh, and then 
at 7 o'clock tonight at Union Cemetery in Arnold is the uh, sunset ceremony. And I think Charlie covered pretty much everything else, so welcome. Oh, yesterday at the L.A. Kiske Historical Society to hear a wonderful presentation by the woman who wrote Fanny Never Flinched, uh, Mary Cronk Farrell, and uh, we're honored to have her again today. And uh, she will also be down uh, at the Union Hall as part of the discussions that we'll be having down there. So uh, without further ado, it is a wonderful book. If you don't have it, uh, please get it through the Ellie Kiske Historical Society. It's full of photographs. It's the most straightforward uh, and elegant written account of Fanny Sullivan that exists. Thank you so much, Charlie. This is hallowed ground. And you're here because you know that. It was hot and muggy on this day a hundred years ago. I imagine Fanny was tired. She'd been working all day and she was, uh, got the message that there were men going to work here. And she came over because she thought, here's an opportunity to talk to more men about joining the union. And as she came up the road, Seven-year-old Stanley Rafalco was on his way to the corner store to get his father a pack of cigarettes. He lived in this house right back here, and when he came out, he saw sheriff's deputies beating a man with their sticks and shooting, firing their guns over the heads of a crowd of women and children. There were some 60 witnesses who say that Fanny Sellins was here herding a group of children towards safety behind a fence that was here because of the gunfire. And she saw them beating up Joseph Starzaleski. She shouted, she tried to save his life. For God's sake, don't kill him, she shouted. And the sheriff's deputies ignored her. At that point, one of the deputies, Joe was on the ground, fired five shots into his back. Then a man from a nearby first aid check came carrying an armload of rifles and started handing them out to the thugs, the sheriff's deputies. And Fanny continued to rebuke them. One of them tried to kick her, and she was running away, and she was struggling to get behind this fence to safety. And what I found in my research is that there were children. She was trying to herd children out of the way of this gunfire. And one of the deputies came up and slammed her against the side of the head with his stick, swinging his club, knocked her to the ground. And the officers fired at her. She was hit with three shots. There were nine bullets found in the fence and gate where Fanny fell. When immigrant women earning poverty wages in St. Louis sweatshops voted to strike, Fanny Sullins was there. When destitute coal mining families dared to unionize in West Virginia and got thrown out of their homes, Fanny was there. And when hired gunmen here in this valley were threatening, beating, and shooting miners walking on the picket line, Fanny was here. That summer of 1919, the mine operators were out to get her. They had threatened to shoot her. She knew that, but Fanny did not go away. She refused. Fanny had been known for a decade for being an angel 
of mercy, bringing shoes and clothing and food to children, to helping destitute families, to talking to women and encouraging them to be courageous. And they told their husbands, go on strike, join the union. They, Fanny passed her courage through the families. She did of what, a lot of what we call today social work. But social work does not threaten people. Nobody gets killed for handing out shoes and clothing. Fanny was working for structural change. Fanny Sellens gave her life fighting the forces of greed and hate, the same forces of greed and hate that remain alive and well today, 100 years later. It's, it's tough sometimes not to get depressed to look around and to wonder, did Fanny die in vain? Sometimes, in the depths of working on a book, I wonder, will I ever be able to finish it? I sometimes stop believing myself. Do I have the skills to do justice to this story? Will it make a difference in the world? It's so easy to start doubting myself. Fanny reminds me not to doubt myself. Fanny's courage came from a deep well of compassion. And compassion can be a well for our courage. But our job, my job, is not to be Fanny Sellens. It's not to stop bullets. Our job is to make damn sure she didn't die in vain. the bricks of justice. She was a bricklayer of justice. We did, we too are bricklayers of justice. Steel workers of justice. Teachers, bakers, barbers, grocery store, mothers, fathers, grandparents, retirees, were bricklayers of justice. We did not lay the foundations, and we will not enjoy the final construction. It's in realizing this that we gain the freedom, the freedom that enables us to act, to move forward, to engage ourselves in our own way in the work of justice to use our own gifts, whatever they might be, our own courage and our own compassion. As bricklayers, our work will always be incomplete. It'll always be an uphill battle, but without the work of each of us, the construction falls to ruin. I'm a professor of history at the Community College of Allegheny County. I'm also honored to be a, bat a member of the Battle of Homestead Foundation. And I would like th to thank the President, John Hare, as well as all of the officers, and especially my friend and mentor, Charlie McAllister, who passionately, passionately <laughs> promotes uh, social justice and certainly the, um, is the, the voice of labor in so many ways. Today we gather to commemorate and celebrate a woman of conviction, a woman of compassion, a woman of courage, and a woman of defiance, Fanny Sellens. While Fanny described her work as the distribution of clothing and food to starving women and babies, to assist poverty-stricken mothers and bring children into the world, and to minister to the sick and close the eyes of the dying, we all know she did so much more than that. This program today, as well as the other events scheduled throughout the day, honor Fanny Sellens, not only 
only as a labor organizer, but as a woman who was willing to give her voice, and we know ultimately her life for workers and families everywhere. I am so honored to be able to introduce another voice for workers, one that is so important to us in this region. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, my brother, Darren Kelly, president of the Allegheny Labor Council. One amazing, amazing, emotional experience. You, you just, that was amazing. And thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, sister, and, and everyone, it is so important that you take time to document the history of our labor movement. And unfortunately, a lot of it in the Black Valley is what this is known for. It is so important because it allows all of us to learn the importance of being able to stand right here. And that is the most important legacy that Fanny has instilled is, brothers and sisters, we are still here. It is the sacrifices of our sister that allowed us to stand up and say no, and to fight when we see social injustice. We can never forget the sacrifices that our patriots have done for us. And one of the most important things when we say the word hollow ground, everything is built up around it. Am I right? Hard as a rock never moves. Society changes. People change. Governments change. Our history and what is important to us never will and never can change. And I thought about when I was going to come up here and I was going to talk about, you know, who Fanny was. I don't have to do that to this crowd. We all knew who she was. But there was one word, the word immigrant. She was feeding and clothing immigrants. And let's not forget at that time, guess who were immigrants? Irish, German, Slovak, am I right? Yeah. Were they treated the same way? Yeah. Isn't it amazing, as the world turns, it comes back around. You have the word of the 100,000 men and women, the Allegheny County Labor Council, that we will never forget the sacrifice that our sister did for all of us. You are her legacy because you speak your voice. Thank you. At this time, I would like to invite to the, to the stage to the area. Um, uh, two uh, wonderful um, people, uh, Nick Molnar and Kip Dawson, United Mine Workers of America retirees. Yeah. So if we could please have Kip and Nick. Started a career in a mine that was a safe place to work and guess why? Because of the work that the United Mine Workers had done and the legacy that was left to them to build on by Fanny Sellens and all the men and women who worked alongside of her to make the things happen that led to a strong union that at one time, and when I was a coal miner this was true, 
was present in almost every coal mine in western Pennsylvania and West Virginia, no longer true unfortunately. But I am able to stand here today and Nick is too because we worked safely. We worked safely because we had a union and we had a union because of the legacy that had been set for us 60 years prior to that, 100 years ago. 50 years ago, there was a, a law passed in Pennsylvania, in the United States, the Mine Safety and Health Act. That law never would have been passed, and God knows it would not have been enforced were it not for the union that Fanny Sellens was one of the people who laid down her life for. Now, the word immigrant has come up, and I want to take this story back to her time and try and put a little bit more perspective on what was going on around this area at that time because it involved my family and all of our predecessors. In the 1919, there was a war going on. There were several wars going on in Pennsylvania. There were wars against black people. The Ku Klux Klan was a mass organization in the state at that time. There were wars against people who had the nerve to stand up for unions. And there certainly were wars against immigrants. The war that was going on then, not far from here in Erie, Pennsylvania, took the life of my grandmother's husband. He was a Jewish immigrant who had the nerve to come to this country and stand up for the black people the Ku Klux Klan was um, on a campaign against, the unionists like Fanny Sellens, and pe the same people who were living in these homes here, who were trying to raise families who were immigrants. That war took a lot of lives, and Fanny Sellens is one who we can commemorate with great love and determination to keep her work going. I would bet that if she were standing here in 2019, whatever the year this is, she would be saying, the shots in the back against those strikers are the same kind of shots from the same place that were shots in the back of Antoine Rose. The harassment and jailing and, and separation of families through the acts of the coal and iron police and the others in, uh, 100 years ago are the same people in new iterations that are doing the same thing to our brothers and sisters, the immigrants who are coming to the United States today. The rusting of unions is one of the texts that those people did to make us weaker. And they took away some of our strength. God knows in the coal mines in Pennsylvania right now, you're not going to see the safety that we had because our union is not there anymore, almost entirely. But we still are, aren't we? And she still is, isn't she? And that beautiful children's book that should be in every school library and in, in every classroom in the world <laughs> that tells her story is keeping things going. And goodness knows, goodness knows that from the squad in Washington, D.C. to the young people who are standing up against the destruction of our planet and the Sunrise Movement and, and everywhere that they are, to the young people who I had the honor to teach when I got laid off from the coal mine and got to teach middle school, there are, the human race is moving forward. My mother used to say history, and my mother was a Rosie the Riveter who never graduated from high school, but she was a Fanny Sellens kind of person too. She used to say, and I hold on to this, that our history, human history is a spiral. And sometimes it looks like you're going backwards, but you're always going up from where you were before. So here we are, and things don't look great out there, but gosh darn it, don't we have a heritage to carry forward? And aren't these young people an inspiration that it's gonna happen? So thank you so much to the Battle of Homestead people and for everybody for being here. Many at the time, elected me to be the vice president of the district for two terms, eight years, and subsequently I was elected to another two terms as president of District 2. And I was asked by Cecil Roberts if I'd run on the international ticket as an auditor, which I did and served as an auditor for a while, and then had the opportunity to do the job that I really love to do. And now it was to organize workers. And I joined the organizing staff at the United Mine Workers and did that for quite a few years. It was the best job that I ever had. It was an eye-opening and a rewarding experience, and I've learned so much from it. 
I had the honor to speak here and probably it was 75 years ago or 25 years ago on the 75th anniversary of Fanny Sullivan's murder. It was actually at her grave site where I spoke yet. It was the first time I ever met Tony Slimakowski. <laughs> and if anybody here knows Tony, he was a character. And subsequently, Charlie McAllister, myself, my wife, beautiful wife Melanie sitting there, and a few others of us traveled through Central Europe and traveled through the coal mines and the steel mills of the uh, industrial part of Europe through Poland and Czechoslovakia and Germany. And traveling with Tony was really a hoot because he was an international traveler beyond any shadow of a doubt. I, I know that some of you here today know a lot about Fanny Solids and a lot of folks are here to learn about Fanny. Talk about the, the really tough times that we all went through back in the 1800s and what happened to Fanny Salton's here at this very spot. But I want to talk about what's going on here today in August 26, 2000, and how it compares with what happened in August 2019. In August 2019, there were supposed, the supposed Native Americans, who were themselves immigrants but had been here for a couple of generations, they were suspicious of these new immigrants that the companies were bringing in. They were strangers. They were the Italians, what they called the mix. They were the Polish, you know, the Polacks. And they were the Slavs, you know, like me, a hunky. They didn't speak English. They ate strange food. They had strange customs. Today, 100 years later, there are strangers at our gate. They mostly don't speak English. They eat strange food. They have strange customs. Our leaders call them thieves, gang members, rapists, and murderers. What kind of horror are these people living in in their native countries that they would cross deserts, cross through jungles, walk 3,000 miles across another country to get to our border? Knowing that once they got here, once they got here, there would be somebody standing there to rip their children from their arms and lock them up in cages. And thinking that was better than what was going on in their own country where they came from. My God, the hell they must have been living in. Today we have leaders who control their supporters and chant, lock her up. Newly elected congressional representatives, send them back. Talking about Charlottesville, Virginia, stating there were good people on both sides. <laughs> Our leader, whose wife is holding an orphan baby, whose parents were killed by a mass murder in El Paso, Texas, a murder who praised our leader in a manifesto. A leader, our leader was smiling and gave a thumbs up as he held that poor, innocent orphan baby. We have representatives in the House and the Senate who are like an old coal miner told me when I asked him about the another member's political position on an issue, the old timer said, ah, that other guy is like a window. He's like a window pane. He has no side. I want to vote for a leader who has learned the lessons of the past, a leader who had a vision for the future that encompasses us all, not the rich and the powerful. Some of you will no doubt criticize me for not for not staying on the purpose of our gathering here. But as a unionist, a United Mine worker, I feel that Fanny, Joe, and Tony would haunt me if it, I did not speak my mind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick and Kip. At this time, we're going to um, invite our performers over. Uh, please, that we get to have this performance featuring Ann Feeney and the Fanny Sellins uh, chorus today. So while they're getting set up, I know that uh, last year I was so honored to be the recipient of the Mother Jones Award that was uh, given to me by the Pennsylvania Labor History Society. And I spoke a little bit about my own experience um, as uh, the daughter of a union man. Um, my grandfather immigrated here in 1913 when he was 16 years old from Italy. He went to Coal Center and he worked in a coal mine.
My father was a factory worker for 43 years, and there was certainly a reminder, constant reminder in our household that it was the union that put food on our table. It was the union that allowed my parents to buy and own their own home. And it was certainly the union that allowed him, my father and my mother, to send six children to a Catholic school, which is virtually unheard of today. of Fanny and all of those other organizers is so near and dear to my heart. And as a member of the AFT Local 2067 at CCAC, I try certainly to live out the legacy of Fanny Sellens every single day. So, if we're ready, are we ready? Yeah. My grandfather, who was a UNW organizer, and these sheriff's deputies were not deputies at all. They weren't civil servants. They were total, as my grandfather testified in 1919, they rounded up all the drunks and people out in the drunk tanks and uh, uh, thugs, gangsters, people on parole, and uh, told them that they could do whatever they wanted to strikers. And so that's how this happened. It was it was murder. It was deliberate murder, state organized and uh, never uh, successfully prosecuted. In labor's glorious history was many a union made Who stood up to the bosses so staunch and unafraid Molly Jackson, Mother Jones fought for a better way But we'll sing of Fanny Sellens and remember demonstrations uh, fighting for workers rights we really appreciate it here and also the Fanny Sullins chorus let's give it up for the Fanny Sullins chorus I really wanted to just end with the read, reading every we've heard bits and pieces of it but I think this should somewhere should be engraven on stone not that stone but on a stone the only wrong like her mentor, Mother Jones, Fanny Sullen supported union miners or families during strikes 
lockouts, explosions, accidents, and unemployment. She described her work as the distribution of clothing and food to starving women and babies, assist poverty-stricken mothers, bring children into the world, minister to the sick, close the eyes of the dying. When she was forbidden by a court injunction to speak on behalf of Miners Union in Collier, West Virginia, Fanny, asserting her free speech rights as an American, refused to be silenced and was jailed after speaking. She said, I am free and I have a right to walk or talk any place in this country as long as I obey the law. I have done nothing wrong. The only wrong they can say I've done is to take shoes to the little children in Colliers who needed shoes. And when I think of their bare little feet, blue with the cruel blast of winter, it makes me determined that if it be wrong to put shoes on those little feet, then I will continue to do wrong as long as I have hands and feet to crawl to Colliers, West Virginia. Thank you, Fanny Sullivan. First of all, I want to welcome everybody to uh, Local 1196 Union Hall. My name is Todd Barbio. I'm the current president of Local 1196. Uh, as you see, there's a lot of history, uh, and we wanted to decorate appropriately. And uh, this wall here at our monument, when we were we had an illegal lockout, so this wall is very important to me. So I thought this was the most appropriate place to put our our, uh, our podium, and have everyone speak from that because, like I said, that's very important to all of us. So. Uh, a couple things, so I want to talk about uh, putting this thing together and how much work it was. And the Battle of Homestead, this group really really helped us a lot. I can't thank the people that helped us from our local 1196, local 1196 1. Um, like I said, if it wasn't for them, we could never put this, we could never pull this off. So it was definitely a team effort. Um, I want to talk about our first meeting, and this is very important, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Our first meeting was March 26th. And uh, we planned it like a wedding, the uh, Battle Homestead Group and uh, Local 1196, 1196-1. And uh, we were upstairs, and we talked for maybe an hour, hour and a half, and, and how we wanted to put this together. We wanted to be up at the Rock, we wanted to be here, we wanted to be over the cemetery. So we, we were going to cover a lot of ground. We also talked about Tony Slomkowski a lot, because this is his baby. This is what he lived for. And. Um, Unfortunately, at the end of the meeting, we all come downstairs, sort of congregated outside a little bit, a little bit of chit chat, people going to the bathroom, people getting water. And I, I believe it might have been Charlie that came out and said, hey, I got bad news, uh, Tony just passed away. So how ironic, it was the same day that we were meeting. Yeah, okay, Scott called, okay, and, and it, how sad, because we were actually upstairs planning, hey, what can we do with Tony? We know he's in bad shape, but we gotta make sure we have a wheelchair for him so he has a place, and, you know, this is important. We're gonna run this thing and he's gonna be very proud. And like I said, we got the bad news. So um, it's, it, it was sort of tough for us. Um, for, for those of you guys that don't know Tony, he's actually our president of Local 1196 here. He was a machinist. He was our president from 91 to 94. So um, ironically, a couple things. I spent a lot of time with Tony. And um, this is Tony and myself over at the Monument probably five or six years ago. So. I don't know whether he was breaking me in or I don't know, he friended me, I don't know what was going on. But uh, what was interesting is last year, but last year, um, I believe it was July 29th, was his birthday party. Always had a big birthday party, had local pop from Natrona, 
uh, Bluski, it was all, all hunky food, that's, what, that's just the way it was. So me and my wife, we showed up, everybody's outside, where's Tony at? He's in the house. So um, we go in to see Tony, wish him happy birthday, give him a little present, because he didn't want nothing, he just wanted us to be there. And he says, I'm glad you guys are here. And he's sitting on his couch. And he says, hey, get that, get that binder up there. Well, Tony had a whole wall full of history. And we're like, hey, happy birthday. And you know, just make a small talk. He's get that binder for me. I got the binder. Hey, we need to start talking about this fanny selling thing. We gotta get this thing underway. So his birthday wasn't about him. I know this was a very important day for him. So um, like I said, we have to we have to make it the best we could make it. So there was a lot of talk about how we were gonna structure this and a possible restoration of the monument and, and that that would take a lot of money and take a lot of people, take a lot of time, and, and wonder if we're gonna get the statue back in time. So our local, Local 1196, along with 1196-1, we paid to have the monument cleaned and, and, and freshened up as best as possible. Um, during that time, I tried to get a lot of publicity. I called the local papers, I wanted them to be there. I wanted them to see this statue being cleaned. I wanted the free publicity is what I wanted. I wanted this place to be filled. I'm very pleased it's, it's as full as it is. But uh, I wanted the free publicity. And, and like I said, I, I, I want to thank everybody for being here. This, this is huge. So there's a couple other things I need to talk about. Uh, number one, for those of you that aren't going over to see the monument, these are pictures I took with my, my phone, so they're not great pictures. There's the top of, of Fanny's statue, OK? That's, that's the condition it's in. It was in. There's the finished product. There's a before. There's an after, unfortunately. I, I, you know. So I know Tony would be very pleased about that. Um, what was interesting is I actually went over, I made a point of going over when they were cleaning it. And a guy come over across the alley and he says, I gotta tell you something, he says, you uh, your relation or what's going on here? I says, no, I'm a union man and I, I'm from the local Brackenridge 1196 and this is important to us. And he says, I gotta tell you something, I'm a union guy too. I actually drove truck, I was in, always in a union. He says, you can't believe how many people come and visit this. And I says, really, I'm touched by that. He says, he says you, wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. He says, almost every day. He says, sometimes people have little kids there and actually showing them the statue. And they're kind of wandering around. So uh, that, was good to, that was good to know. I mean, so the statue is important. Like I said, anybody can't make it this evening, you got to see the, the uh, finished product. So it's, it's very nice. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about, which is really important, I, I, nobody really knows about this yet. A couple of people, a couple of my friends here, a couple of coworkers. Uh, Mrs. DeBoer up on the hill, that was, her pro that was her property we were on. She's very, very nice. She, um, I went up and knocked on the door, and I told her who I was, and, and I says, hey, we're going to be having a celebration of Fanny Sellins. And she says, I know all about her. She says, I know about the monument, but do you know about the rock? I, rode, I had to get signatures from the, the neighborhood to make sure, hey, we're not, we're not bothering nobody. So it was a little bit of messing around. So the last day, in fact, it was Friday, this, it just passed. Um, I, I stopped up to see her because I needed her signature. Her, hers was the final signature. She says, come in, I want you to meet my husband. So I went in the house and uh, she says, this is my husband. She says, you know, he has uh, uh, early stages of dementia and uh, you know, he can't walk real well. Because I wanted him to be here. And they said, they just can't do it. She said, but come inside. So like I said, we, I met her husband and they wanted me to sit down and talk a while. So we started talking. I just tell her, hey, I'm like a junk collector. Right? And this stuff's all, I'm real sensitive to, to history. and. My garage is like a museum, which it is. And uh, as we got talking, I says, you know what sort of scares me is, is cause she told me, she's, I'm 84 years old. My husband keeps saying we're 66, but we're not. <laughs> she says, I'm 84 and he's 86. And he says, oh, I never said that. They got in a little bit of argument. Yeah. But then it, it, they settled down. So um, I says, hey, um, I says, you know what sort of scares me as a person who, who is sensitive to, to history and, and likes all this stuff. I says, my worry is, and, and, and unfortunately it's part of life. You're passing, your husband's passing, my retiring from the mill, not being involved in, in, in union history. I, I often wonder what's gonna happen to this rock. And I says, you know, somebody's gonna come along and they're gonna remodel and say, hey, that rock, let's move that and put a wall there and flowers and that rock's going over the hill. And I started to ask her, I, I was 
I was gonna ask her for the rock. That's what was my intent. And she says to me, hey, that's why I'm glad you're here. I want to talk to you. She says, would you be interested in taking that rock? So I'm, I'm taking the rock. So I told her, yeah, and I said, don't worry about that. Like I said, uh, I have, I, Scotty's gonna help me. He has, he has a, a bobcat. Uh, we're gonna get it. We're gonna create it. Uh, where's Mike at? Mike Priyanka, are you here somewhere? Yeah, anyway. here. Okay, well, Mike is, is a carpenter. We're gonna build a crate. We're gonna entomb it. Mike is actually the one who built this wall for me. So uh, it'd be nice that fly built for us. This is for us. Yeah. And he put this up a year after our lockout. One year celebration of our lockout. So this is all all stuff that was very important to us. And when he put it up, like it all worked out. So very nice. Very nice. So I, want, I sort of wanted to surprise everybody. I told a couple of guys I could take it. Hey, I'm getting the rock. If like, what are you talking about? So I don't know where, it's, where it needs to go, and, but I got to make sure it goes somewhere. So we talked about it. Mike's going to create it. We're going to put some type of glass on the front, and we're going to get, get a, a, a bronze plaque for it. And I don't know whether it's going to stay here, but I want to talk to uh, Jim Thomas from the, the Trenton Historic Society, and uh, maybe it'll go there. But it, it has a lot of history, and it's important to us. And um, people sort of say, hey, you know, is it, you sure that's the rock? You sure? I, I don't know. There's the rock right there. Yeah. That's yeah. there. It's in the book. Yeah. So, and I looked at that rock, and I went and looked, and it, that's the rock. So, I don't know when, but at some point we're going to get that rock. And, and, but I, I, like I said, i got to figure out where we can put it, where it will be preserved, and, and people will appreciate what it, what it symbolizes. So, um, like I said, once again, I want to thank everybody for, for coming today. Uh, there's a lot of food coming, uh, so enjoy the rest of your day. This is only the second part of the celebration. Like I said, we are going to have some form of procession over over to uh, over to the grave site, and uh, that that'll close the celebration of her life. So um, Stephanie's going to take over. She is from the U.S. <laughs> She's actually from the U.S.W. from the Education Department, and uh, she has a lot to say. What about it is if we fill the if we fill the hall like we have. With all of you, it's going to be hard, like, to do really, you know, what we like to do: workshops and people meet and report back, and you know, so it won't be our, our honor, you know, time-honored education program that we like to do with the popular education, the steel workers. So what we did was um, we put together the program that's in front of you, which has tons of information. It's 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 not as as in depth as. Mary Kwong Farrell's wonderful children's book. The other thing I want to point out is this uh, incredible image that Bill Young, the, an artist that worked with Battle of Homestead made that we have on our banner and on our uh, all of our uh, materials. And then there are about a half dozen folks who helped write these uh, panels. That's also the information that's in, in the book. So we're going to leave these panels up for the week because they have a union meeting this week. So we want to not only share it with those of you who are here to honor Fanny, but also with the members of the local. And then on Friday, I intend to come here while Pam is still here. Uh, Pam is uh, Barbio is the secretary here in the local, and take them down and take them to international headquarters, because we have uh, a crowd of thousands who come through our headquarters on Labor Day, and so we want to share this story. Uh, with our, our Labor Day brother, brethren, brothers and sisters who will be joining us. So I, I, I in, encourage you to take a look at these materials and then to visit them again when you, when you march on Labor Day. I also want to call attention to Jennifer Rempel's incredible painting. Jennifer is here right in front of me. And started coming around a few years ago painted this gorgeous painting of Mother Jones. It was a couple years ago he did the Mother Jones painting. And she said, I'm going to paint all these women who are unsung in the valley. I'm going to... And then she was like, found out about Franny and then found out about the postcard that the My Workers put together and in, uh, to try and get her out of, out of the clink when she was thrown in jail in Collier's, West Virginia. And that gave her the inspiration for, for the painting. And um, maybe during our open mic, you can wa might want to come up here and talk a little bit about your painting. We have a couple of minutes, so it would be nice, because there's a lot more to this painting than meets the eye initially. On top of the hill was Allegheny Still. And in 1942, 
This mallet was used by Russell Richards of Local 1196 to nominate Philip Murray to the first presidency of the United States. So this is the original mallet that was presented to Russell from Philip Murray and Labor Day 2007. I talked to the executive board and to let me take this down to the 10th Street Bridge when they renamed it the Philip Murray Bridge. I almost didn't bring it back. Leo Gerard and I almost got in a fist fight. <laughs> Literally in the middle of the 10th Street Bridge, trying to get this back. But I think it's really symbolic that what she died for led to this and led to all of this. So I think it's time we pay uh, homage to her for what she did. None of this would have occurred without her courage and Allegheny Steel would have not survived. We have a $1.6 billion hot mill sitting in the same site. So the future's bright, and it's all because of organized labor. As I, I was telling people yesterday, um, we were here um, right out of uh, school in Madison, Wisconsin, and came to uh, Pittsburgh, where Bill, uh, over there, um, was a lawyer for the United USW um, under Bernie Kleiman uh, way back in 1969. And that's how I, I was doing some research um, on um, black uh, workers coming from the south, coming up north to work in the steel mills. And I discovered that picture, that horrible, awful picture of Fanny um, in the morgue when she when she died and it was one of those things where I, I've always been a researcher so I just had to know just like uh, Mary was saying yesterday too you just when you see the pictures of, of her you just you need to know more about her and know about her life and so it's a real privilege to be here today I just wanted to read I think it's the most special thing is to read Fanny's words herself and this, this is what she uh, wrote, and this comes from um, St. Louis, um, and uh, Rosemary Furr, who, um, uh, who works with uh, the Northern Illinois University and done a lot of research, and she has a recording of this uh, speech that she gave in uh, St. Louis. But when you hear it, you just know it's Fanny. Um, it doesn't matter where she, where she was. Um, she was in St. Louis, she was in West Virginia, she was here, um, and she was doing her work. So I just want to read um, from this speech that she gave in 1910. In 1910, there was a strike against Marx and Haas uh, clothing, uh, and um, she was with the clothing workers in uh, St. Louis, and um, she was president of their, of their local union. And um, she went all over the country um, after the, when there was uh, the strike to talk about um, the, the trials and the, the difficulties of, of the workers. So I'm just going to uh, read excerpts from this, and bear with me because I'm just going to it's, it's pretty long, so I'm just going to read parts of it, okay? But it'll really give you the feeling of Fanny. And I have to put my glasses on. This firm has announced an irrevocable and unremitting war upon the Garment Workers Union with the avowed purpose of breaking up the union and rendering the members of it, mostly women, the absolute slaves of the masters not only as workers, but they would be compelled to submit to slavery of the body and soul for the privilege of working that they may, might exist. <coughs> I started to work here in 1897. Five years later, the girls and women of this factory organized and started to secure better conditions as to work hours and wages. This establishment had for nine years carried the union label and during that period, the firm had greatly increased in wealth. 
But Marx and Haas, under the influence of the Citizens Industrial Association, the devilish group of businessmen who are part of the quote unquote big cinch that rule this city of St. Louis, took steps in 1909 to destroy the influence of the union leaders in the factory, leading up finally to a complete disagreement, which the employers called a strike and we call a lockout. The work of this factory is all piecework. It is so much divided that it is comparatively easy to break in new help. Speed is a factor which is essential. I made hunting coats with 11 pockets, weighing nine pounds. And if you're wondering about how you can help, where you can make a difference, well, let's think about it. There are people who go to work today who won't go home. Somebody won't come home from work today because they're hurt in a workplace accident. They're killed on the job. So we have to work to make sure that doesn't happen again. We still have work to do. There are women who are making 77 cents on the dollar for every man who's working. Income inequality. We still have work to do. Fanny Salins' murderers were never brought to justice. That says something about her value in our society at that time. And when we think about it, women still earning less than men and being subjugated to male domination in the workplace through sexual harassment and other things, we know that we still have a lot of work to do. And as I travel Pennsylvania and talk to working men and women all across the state and hearing the issues, that they're bringing forward and that they wish that there was someone who understood what life was like for working men and women. And I tell them, well, I work for the Steelworkers Union. I've advocated on behalf of men and women across the country in our union, fighting for dignity and respect, workplace equality. And not only that, with marginalized work, uh, groups of people in Pennsylvania, all across the state. So yes, there is someone who hears your voice. And not just me, but I'm sure the good people like you as well. And that's why we're here today. Not only to commemorate Fanny Sellins, but to make sure that her legacy lives on and that we continue to work and fight for justice and equality every single day of our lives. That's how we serve her. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, now I'm going to call uh, up to the podium Brian Brown, um, a young man who I'm just meeting now, but I had received in the mail uh, some of his work for this wall and for the program, so it's, it's wonderful to actually meet Brian. He's just written a book about the 1919 steel strike, and it's a... Um, <coughs> It's a, it's a topic, oftentimes in the, in the labor movement, we, we don't like to dwell on, uh, on our losses. We don't like to dwell on our failures. It took a long time for us to get materials put together on the 1892 steel strike that was, we lost, but we have managed to organize and we now use it as a rallying cry. And as many of the speakers have talked today, even though we lost in 1919, we have learned valuable lessons about the importance of inclusion of, of, of immigrants in our fight uh, against the, the Red Scare and the, the importance of including black workers and all the stuff that's on the wall. Um, and I want to applaud Ryan uh, for taking on this very difficult and uh, distant subject. So come on, Ryan, let's tell us about your book. I didn't have any really prepared remarks, but I just wanted to talk. You know, in my research for this book, I read all about Fanny Sellins, about the incidents that led up to her death. And uh, what really struck me, you know, I, I read a lot about the first Red Scare at the same time. And when she was killed, the authorities said that uh, her homicide was uh, the result of her having spread uh, Bolshevist doctrines among the aliens in the area. It really, it really struck me that, like, the one thing they feared more than anything else at that time was uh, you know, working people in different industries or across an industry all having the same identity as being working people. That was kind of a new concept for a strike that large. Uh, and I was just thinking how 
recently, I'm, I'm 29, and so many of the people I know and work with and my friends who have no prior experience in the labor movement are so interested in unions, they're organizing their own workplaces, they're reading about unions in a way that they wouldn't have even a few years ago. And I just, part of the reason I wrote it was because I think that history and culture needs to live on. I'm really excited when people in our area can learn there's actually history to this. You're not the first people to be doing this. Uh, there's all these heroes, like Fanny Sellins, you can look back on. And I want to thank all the union organizers and activists through those generations, thank people like Fanny Sellins. And I also want to thank people in this room who keep that culture and that history alive for the next generations who are hopefully going to be organizing the way they did back then. If you like sluggers to be in your bed, then don't organize all unions you despise. If you want nothing before you are dead, then shake hands with your boss and look wise. But I'll tell you, there is power, there is power in a band of working folk. When we stand, when we stand, hand in hand, hand in hand, that's a power.
I don't know if you guys saw, but yesterday there was a page article in the Post Gazette about this event and about anti-Semitism. Uh, I have one public service announcement before we start, which is don't eat the cake. I see a lot of you eating cupcakes with cupcakes, which is exactly what you're supposed to do. The cake, which is a beautiful representation of the Fanny Salons logo that was done by Cam Barbio. I'm Father Jane Eisler, coming from a long line of uh, labor priests. There's not too many of us left. You're going all the way back to uh, going back to the uh, strike in 1919. Father Cox. I was um, actually mentored by Monsignor Rice and uh, Jack O'Malley, and uh, you talk about uh, long labor. And the reason that uh, as priests we've been involved is. I'm sure that you may have heard about sins crying out to heaven for justice, uh, for example, Cain killing Abel. But a lot of people do not know that one of the sins calling out to heaven for justice is withholding the just wages of the worker. And you know, that's really interesting because it's on the same level as Cain killing Abel. So um, it's, it's a form of murder, um, but it's by serial installment. So that's, uh, that's really what it is. It's slowly starving people to death with uh, unjust wages. The second thing for me is I owe you a debt of gratitude. I was in the uh, Steelworkers Union um, in the... Uh, the late 70s, and uh, it paid for my college education. And uh, you know, think of those days where you could go to, uh, you could work in the mill for the summer and pay for your entire school. Now kids come out with literally, you know, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt. So I really owe a debt of gratitude to you, to you and I hope we can uh, we can change that around. Uh, the other thing I want to say is um, I uh, later also was uh, involved in management and then I went into uh, the steel mill and I was involved with the uh, Aliquippa steel workers when LTV Steel Corporation first stole their health care and then their, and their pensions and Monsignor Rice uh, came down to mentor me. I want to let you know he gave me a lot of advice but I'd already learned how to be arrested on my own. So. <laughs> need me to do that so um, and he was such a such an interesting guy and uh, here's a something at the very end of his life I just want to let you know that um, my sister actually took care of him uh, when he was in the priest home at the age of 90 and uh, she would come in and give him ice cream three times a day and all the other nurses would be upset and he would call her his angel, and I'll end with this and say a prayer. I just want to let you know that um, in the last 30 days I took a pilgrimage, and uh, I traveled 12,000 miles by rail, uh, 1,500 by car, 1,000 uh, by plane, uh, 500 uh, by bus, and then I took short, uh, five short boat trips. And I really um, traveled to meet people and talk to people and, and you know, there is a lot of turmoil in this country about the separation between the rich and the poor. And you know, the greatest time that it was at its lowest was after World War II when the unions were the strongest. And um, I think back, one of the places that I went, other than 9-11, you know, Oklahoma City bombing, went up to the Kennedy Memorial up in Hyannis, but I made, I made my way to uh, San Diego. I went to the Naval Port where my father, at the age of 17, 1945, went to war in the Pacific and he was in the uh, Okinawa uh, on the ship and he was actually in Tokyo Bay to surrender and was occupied. But when he came out, he got the GI Bill. And I want to let you know that my great-grandfather was an Irish immigrant, worked in the mills, he couldn't even sign his name. And what an opportunity that education is. And you know, I know that people say education is expensive, but it's not compared to ignorance. And you know, it's a shame that we don't educate people. And I you know, say shame on the unions, the teachers unions, that they don't have in their school curriculums what 
union organized about and how it's important for this country. So I just want to let you know that. Thank you. Let me just say a, a prayer of blessing on you. And remember that uh, one of the sins that cries out to heaven for justice is withholding the just wage of the worker. Amen. Loving God, when we work, we hold stable, as it says in Sirach, the fabric of the world, and that our work is as our prayer. And so I thank you for all those who keep this country going. And Lord, I cry out for you. We call out for justice for those who abuse the workers, that uh, exploit those who are powerless. And we know that uh, you pull down the rich and you lift up the lowly, and that we who are humble in your sight, you will lift and give us justice. Amen. 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 Hello, everyone. Um, first off, thank you. I'm proud to be here tonight to honor a very extraordinary woman, Fanny Sellins. Um, I'm also here to introduce the first speaker, who also is a very incredible woman. I had to uh, write some notes down because she's accomplished so much, so please bear with me for one moment. Leanne Foster is the newest international vice president to the United Steelworkers. She has served the union for more than 22 years as assistant to the international president and associate general counsel. Leanne became the executive assistant to the UPIU President Boyd Young in 1998 and assisted Boyd Young in the merger to form the, PACE, to form the Paper Allied Industrial and Chemical Workers International Union known as PACE. Leanne was also a very integral part in the formation of the National Paper Bargaining Program. PACE's National Rapid Response Network for Legislation Action, and Leanne has chaired and co-chaired bargaining for all major paper companies and played a central role in the development of coordinated bargaining, which now dominates the industry. She has developed and led a program to confront health and safety issues in the paper sector. Also, last but not least, Leanne oversees the United Steelworkers Women of Steel Leadership Development Program and the USW Women of Steel Department reports directly to her. She co-chairs the Industrial Global Union Federalization Pulp and Paper Sector Working Group and is the Democratic candidate for Ward 3 Commissioner in Mount Lebanon. It is my pleasure to welcome and introduce United Steelworkers International President Leanne Foster. Colleen so much for the introduction and I want to thank um, you for your invitation to be here because it's been um, I come from a different sector of the Union from the paper sector and this has been such an educational experience for me just learning about Fanning and learning about this piece of history in our Union so thank you so much for that um, I want to also thank um, our Union and our community team that became the Sellens Planning Committee and made sure that this commemoration continued to take place. Fanny Sellens was a proud Union woman. She fought for a better life for herself, her family, her sisters and brothers, all workers and Union members. Our Steelworker delegation here today honors the life and work of Fanny, and today we declare her to be an honorary woman of steel. like Mariana, who is the MC of this event, who is also an attorney, but is our assistant director of organizing. Like Colleen, who's one of our staff representatives from District 10, who was a unit president out of Express Scripts in North Huntington. And Kelly Vera, who works for US Steel at Urban Works and is the District 10 co-chair for Women of Steel. And Susan Schwartz, who is soon retiring from our organization, but is also an attorney, and is an educator in our uh, membership development department. And Steffi Domike, who's also a labor educator for us and got her first union card at U.S. Steel's Clarity Department. I want to give Steffi a special shout out because I know all the work and passion that she put in for the steelworkers' contribution to this event, so thank you so much, Steffi. Give a 
shout out to Brenda Warren. I saw her earlier. Um, the unit president for Local 1196-1. Yeah. And I know we have sisters here from ATI, and I look forward to meeting with you um, after the ceremony. I'm particularly, particularly proud of this local, Local 1196, which has honored Selen's memory for the past century. You represent the best of our union. You do so by honoring Fanny Sellens, who was martyred for our cause, for the cause of all workers fighting for justice. You strengthen our union for the future by remembering the struggles it took for us to gain representation, learning for our, from our past, and fighting every day for a better life from our members. The displays in this union hall are a testament to your efforts to keep our history alive. So let's give a big round of applause for local audience. be here with my brothers and sisters from the United Mine Workers of America. It is here in UMWA District 5 that the United Steel Workers of America was dreamt of by our common union ancestors. Philip Murray, who would become the president of both the Steelworkers Organizing Committee and the first international president of the United Steel Workers of America, was president of UMWA District 5. And in 1919, it was he who hired Fanny Sellens. In 1918, the UMWA took the lead with the industry-wide organizing committee created by the American Federation of Labor to help support and form the Steelworkers Union. I thank you, and I ask for a round of applause for our brothers and sisters from the United States. So tonight, I have three objectives. One is to join with you, brothers and sisters, to remember our brave sister and fellow woman of steel, Fanny Sellens. A second is to renew our solidarity with all of you, union members and sons, daughters, parents and children of union members, coal miners and steel workers. Third is to look at our movement today through the lens of the fights in 1919 and the eyes of Fanny Sellens and ask, what are the parallels to today? What can we learn from our past? Fanny was a seamstress who came into the labor movement in 1902 by organizing St. Louis's Local 67 of the United Garment Workers of America. By 1909, she was the local union president. An inspirational and passionate speaker, Selen spoke of the need for all workers to have representation, and she knew that our strength comes from solidarity. In 1909, Selen spoke to a group of coal miners in Illinois. Help us fight, she said. We women work in factories on dangerous machinery, and many of us get horribly injured or killed. Many of your brothers also die in the mines. There should be a bond of sympathy between us, for we both encounter danger in our daily work. The mine workers and the garment workers both understood that this bond of sympathy between all workers is, in, is integral to forming a, a strong labor movement. And a century ago, these unions practiced pragmatic industrial unionism expanding their organizing to include all who worked. As we say in our union, everybody in, nobody out. In 1913, Selma was hired by the mine workers as an organizer and sent to Collier's, West Virginia, a company town. There she worked with families of striking miners. A federal judge in the pocket of the coal operators outlawed the union. In defiance, Fanny Sellens walked the picket line and the strikers with the strikers and was arrested, giving a jail sentence of six months. She spent three months in jail until the mine, worker, mine workers raised her bail. As you heard up at the site of the murders earlier today, and as you can see in the beautiful painting of Selens as she sat in her jail cell, Selens declared her belief in her rights as an American citizen. I am free, and I have a right to walk or talk in any place in this country as long as I obey the law. The only wrong I have done is to take shoes to the children in Collier's, whose bare feet are blue from the cr cruel blasts of winter. If it's wrong to put shoes on those little feet, then I will continue to do so, do wrong as long as hands and, I have hands and feet to crawl to Collier's. Knowing that for the labor movement to succeed, the steel industry had to be organized. In 1917, the mine workers sent Selens to coal and steel company towns in the Allegheny Valley including Brackenridge and Natrona, to organize the families of steelworkers to withstand a strike. She spoke with the women in the community, 
and told them that there was a path out of misery, and that path was with the union. Fannie Sellins knew that the companies would try to exploit the differences among workers to divide their loyalties. Here's an example of how she confronted this problem. Lewis's Hicks Mines in the Allegheny Valley went out on strike in 1917. Instead of negotiating with the mine workers, Hicks brought in southern black workers to break the strike. The strikers heard about a train of black workers that were coming to town. Sellins waited at a railroad signal outside of town. As the train slowed down, she ran along the tracks shouting, don't break the strike, support the union. A hundred men from Alabama abandoned the train. After that, the coal and iron police knew who she was and they were out for her. What are the parallels for today? What can we learn from the past? While the law was stacked against unions and union organizers in 1919, and although we have made great strides to get the right to organize, our rights are constantly under attack now. And we must fight not only to defend our rights, but to gain better legal protections for workers who seek to join a union. Law enforcement in 1919 was subject to being purchased by the powerful coal and steel operators. Today, corporate lobbyists have gained enormous power to influence legislators. The Supreme Court decision on Citizens United opened the doors for unlimited corporate donations to political campaigns. Big money still can buy government, and it's important as ever for us to work together to support candidates for office who support working people and who cannot and will not be bought. And it's fitting that today is Women's Equality Day. Today commemorates the 99th anniversary of women's right to vote. So on this day that we celebrate family. Immigrants were discriminated in employment and housing as well as, as well as being attacked physically, as Joe Starzeski was in Natrona on August 26, 1919. Even though most of us in this room are the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of immigrants, Today, newcomers are demonized. We are seeing immigrants, both documented and undocumented, being reviled by the president of our country. Some of the recent mass shootings have targeted Mexicans and Spanish-speaking citizens. The United Steelworkers takes a strong stand against the current treatment of asylum seekers, particularly the cruel and inhumane family separations on our southern border. fan the flames of racism, recruiting unemployed black sharecroppers from the South as strike breakers at northern mines and mills. This is dangerous, divisive, and it unfortunately is still used today. During the recent lockout, ATI intentionally hired black mill guards and scabs, knowing full well that that would inflame divisions among workers and our communities. Red baiting was a company tactic in 1919 and is back in use today. Union organizers are called communists or socialists. When they speak of workers' rights and workplace democracy, they are accused of introducing dangerous ideas to workers. This prejudice strongly influenced the attitude of the coroner's office to find the mine guards killing of Selens as self-defense. But we know that Selens' ideas were the furthest thing from dangerous. At the 1921 Mine Workers commemoration of her death, Robert R. Gibbons, president of UMDA, UMWA District 5, said, Fanny Sellins gave her life in the attempt to put an end to the suffering of the miners and their families, to lead them out of wage slavery. Mrs. Sellins was a noble woman. She had taken part in the organization of many mines in the Pittsburgh district. For this work, the women loved her, men revered her, children worshiped her, and the enemy abused and murdered her. Her life was filled with ministrations of love, kindness, and mercy. Yeah. In thinking about the future of our important work to build and defend working people and our movement, we can look at Fanny and take our cues from her fights. Fanny Stellens was not a new immigrant, but she fought with and for new immigrants in the sweatshops of St. Louis. She fought with and for new immigrants on strike at mine portals. And she ur urged new immigrant families of steel workers in the Allegheny Valley to join in her fight for a better life. 
Fanny Sellins was the seamstress, fought for the nine hour day a century ago so that we could enjoy time away from our work. We must de defend against corporate attacks on this right by reducing, resisting forced overtime, which is rampant across manufacturing. In fact, manufacturing. In fact, we have a local right now in our paper sector who's getting ready to go out stri on strike over mandatory overtime. Fanny's leadership and bravery in the face of overwhelming corporate power and abuse inspires us to follow in her footsteps and tackle the problems in our communities and workplaces. A woman of steel stands firm. A woman of steel does not back down. Thank you, Fanny Sellins, for standing firm, for not backing down. It is your courage, your commitment, and compassion that lives on in all of us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, I would I would like to begin with a, a point of privilege, if you may. I first became aware of Fanny Sellers in 1991. I was a mine worker since 1976 and had been a full-time union officer since 1989. But there was one person who brought Fanny Sellers to my attention. And it became a dear friend of mine. And I just want to thank the still workers here for Tony Slomkowski and everything he did for both you and for us and for all of organized labor. I have an easy job here because that's the introduction of the speaker who you're about to hear next. And he is a 38-year-old member of the United Mine Workers of America who happens to be our secondary treasurer. And we are very proud of that. We'll tell you something a little bit about Levi. Not only Levi is a prolific speaker, as you will hear just in a couple of minutes, but he is a staunch union person. He's very intelligent. He knows our contracts in and out. And I'm telling you one thing right now, he is prepared sometime in the future, like Cecil Roberts says, not, a, not for a long time. Not for a long time. And I'm not saying it because I don't want Cecil. This will get back to Cecil because there's no secrets in the room. But at some point in the future, and Cecil will even admit to that, is assuming the leadership of, of this union. And it is my great honor and privilege to not only call him my brother, but to call him my dear friend. I give you our Secretary Treasurer, Lee Bell. Every time you get a good introduction like that, you bomb. That's just the way, that's the way it goes. Uh, wow, well, uh, this has kind of been a tough day, so. Um, I don't know how well this is gonna really gonna go. Uh, I do wanna take a quick minute just to uh, give a little bit of appreciation to Ed. Um, look, I was cocky 34 year old guy in the mine workers, you know, I kinda went out and started uh, handling some grievances and arbitrations and things like that for the mine workers. And uh, I thought I knew everything. And I did at that point in time. And, uh, Ed really, I don't know if you know this about Ed, but Ed is like a pro when it comes to broaching really difficult subjects. And everybody will sit and say, we don't need to talk about that. And Ed's like, oh yes, we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about that in depth. We're going all the way, all, all the way to the roots. Um, and I learned just so much from Ed about, about democracy and about free speech and about what it takes to make sure that a union operates um, overtly and transparently uh, and in a way that breeds solidarity and coalesces the membership and uh, he's a very dear friend he believes in yeah I mean I think if he and I could pick one thing that needs to go away like we would say abolish Taft Hartley now so we can have solidarity Thank and we you. can raise hell right, that, that's where we can be. So, Thank you, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, so look, I know none of y'all know me, 
I'm going to do uh, just like a brief moment to give you a little bit of background on me um, and also use it as a moment to give you all uh, some appreciation for, for the life's work that you've all done. So, um, 38 year old guy, 38 year old guy, coal miner, worked underground. Hey, how you doing, brother? Nice to see you. Um, worked underground uh, at Marshall County Mine. But I grew up in this little uh, 14 by 75 trailer out in Middle Grave Creek in Moundsville, West Virginia. So, I mean, if that shows you how far you can go, you can grow up in the 14 by 75 trailer in the middle of nowhere and go all the way to the International President or International Secretary Treasurer. Sorry, I tried to get myself a promotion uh, in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, gotta, gotta get back to Cecil. Um, but so, so look, I'm Levi Allen, but I. I uh, I never really knew my, my family, my, my, uh, the Allen side of my family. I was raised by, by a Polish family, you know. I mean, John Levinsky was my dad, you know. His mom was Helen Gursky, you know, and, uh, and Stanley Levinsky. So I was raised by a bunch of Polish. I ate uh, halupki and uh, pierogies all the time at Grandma's house. She had the best pierogies ever. Those dry clotted cheese ones, man, they were awesome with the dill in them and the scallions. Man, I loved them. Um, so I never really had too much appreciation for the Allen side of my family, but I was really blessed. Um, I grew up next to a woman named Ruth Ann Harrigan, and uh, Ruth Ann Harrigan was born Ruth Ann Allen, uh, and she was my great uncle Leo's daughter. So she was, she was but my first cousin twice removed or something like that. Um, and. Everything I learned about that Allen side of my family, like my grandma being the acting sheriff in Marshall County, like where our family's farm was and all that kind of stuff, I learned from Ruth Ann. And uh, sadly, Ruth Ann passed away after a 25-year battle with various types of cancer um, in December of this year, or last year. And I just want to take a minute to tell you all thank you. Okay, because she went through this horrible disease, the, the plague of the 20th and 21st century on humankind. And she never had to worry about losing her home. She never had to worry about leaving her family with some crushing weight of medical debt. She never had to worry about whether or not her, her husband was going to have peace of mind and going to be able to pay the bills. And the reason for that, the reason she was able to get that treatment is because her husband, John, is a 50-year member of UMWA Local Union 1473. Yay. And everything that they have and everything that I have in my life is because of the fight of organized labor in the United States of America. And I just want to take a minute just to give you all appreciation for everything that I have. Uh, in my life and, and for taking care of my family before you ever knew my name. So, so thank you. All right, this, is gonna be, this is gonna be a tough day and we're gonna talk about Fanny here in a minute, um, but because this is a sad day and I'll get into that in just a second, I, I'm gonna need to just like get with y'all just for a second and like I'm gonna ask you to do something that I think anchors the whole human race together in a, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful way. I'm just going to ask you all to take two deep breaths with me, all right? Because this is, and I'll, and I'll get to it in just a second, all right? So let's just, all of us just take two deep breaths together, all right? Now I do that. Because I get really nervous for one, um, and I shouldn't be, because I'm, I'm, I am all of you. I uh, realize we're all cut from the same cloth. Um, but I really think nothing anchors humanity together like our breath. There's some shared sense of purpose in that. Every breath you breathe out, I breathe in. We've been doing that forever. We're breathing the same air that Fanny Selims breathed, uh, and, and there's a shared purpose in that. And, and people in their lives do really good things with their breath. They, 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 they talk. Every, every laugh that escapes your lips, lips comes from your breath. Every word that you utter comes from your breath. And all your purpose, all your connection with your fellow man, most of it comes through conversation and, and through your breath. Um, so what's hard for me today is a very dear friend of mine uh, named, named Marty Hudson. Nick, this might be a news to you, so I'm, I don't mean to break a tough subject. Um, a very dear friend of the mine workers, President Roberts' former chief of staff last night was killed in a car accident. His name is Marty Hudson. And uh, 
very dear friend, and it's been a rough day, and I, I usually prepare a speech or something like that, but I, I couldn't get my mind out of that loop today. Uh, and what it kept running back to me was, so the last conversation I had with Marty, um, we were having lunch together, and you know, I'm, I'm a nerdy 38-year-old, uh, you know, I, I was a bookworm and everything like that, and ended up in the blue-collar world, and uh, so I struggle sometimes with identity, and Marty looked at me, and he was so funny about it, because he had a real way of being matter of fact, and I, I think it probably relates a lot to the way Fanny was, and he said, you know, you're our secretary treasurer, right? You didn't like become who you are because you're secretary treasurer. You're the secretary treasurer because of who you are. So why don't you just quit trying to put on a show or anything and do your do your job, man. Be yourself. And uh, Chucky's laughing because I know he's sitting there thinking that is so Marty. Except he do it with this real slow draw from down Boone County, West Virginia. Great man. I love him. Uh, and uh, it brings me to purpose. And look, everybody's going to know a lot more about Fanny Sellins than I am. Uh, I think Orwell hit the nail on the head. Who controls the past, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. She's been erased from American history. So I'm so thankful uh, for Local 11, 1196, right? For, for fighting for it. Fighting for it to make sure that this is remembered. Making sure this is, what's that? Uh, it's time. Our wonderful caterers are packing up the week. And I think we should take a moment to thank them. You know, music, food, beer, yeah. and unionism. Yeah. You know, those are the great conveniences. Um, but so, so, and, and I think Father was, you know, getting around to it or, or working in that area. You know, I think our life was pretty well laid out. You know, Christ laid it out in John 15, 12, and, and, and 13. He said, you know, for this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. For greater love hath no one than this, and they laid down their life for a friend. And I know we're here on the anniversary of Fanny's death, but it's not her death who made her who she was. It's how she lived her life. It's how she gave those breaths and what she did with them. It wasn't the day that she died that she organized the garment workers in St. Louis. It was the days that she lived that she did that. And even on the day that she died, she was out there fighting for justice, like yeah. using, physically using her body to keep the voice of the voiceless going. Yeah. She was out there giving every breath that she had in her body, all right, every breath that she had in her body to give a better life for workers. And that's how we have to live our lives. That's how, the, there's only one way we're going to get there. And that's what I think is so beautiful about the steel workers and the mine workers coming together. We just did the 30th anniversary of the Pistons right down there. There's no way we would have won that strike without the solidarity of the entire labor movement, without all of us coming together and having <laughs> stake in that claim. It's meaningful. It's the only way we're going to win is if we all coalesce and we all come together. And that's what Fannie Sellins was about. That's what she lives her life. Think about what was going on in the United States of America at the time that she joined, that she signed up to do this. Okay? So you had the Paint Creek and Cabin Creek strike. It just happened 1912, 1913. For heaven's sake, you had the Ludlow tragedy massacre happen out there in 1914. She's like, oh yeah, sign me up for a little bit of this. Let's do that. <laughs> that is a tough, tough, tough woman right there. And she was doing it in a time where women weren't even people. You know I mean, if you think we the people of the United States, you can't vote, you're not the people. Women weren't even the people at that point in time. All of that came, all of that came on the backs of people like Fanny Sellins. And she fought for that every single day because what she knew what she knew is that unless all of us can come together, all of us can come together, we're going to be moving backwards. There is hope out there. And the hope is in this room. The hope is in every conversation that we have. 
the hope is in every breath that we take as long as we keep being willing to share that with all of us. We don't operate with exclusivity. I know we're membership driven organizations, but that's why our little constitutional democracies, our little republics are so well suited to deal with these adverse times. Because yes, we are membership driven organizations, but our membership has always been based on inclusivity, allowing everybody to be part of us. Because when we're one, we can win. And when we can win, we can change the world. When we can change the world, we can all be free. We are the quote on the Statue of Liberty. Give us your poor, your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. That is the American labor movement. And it's about time we reclaim that spot and quit letting these people call us radicals, call us socialists, call us communists, call us whatever the hell they want. Because we are America. We're the people who are going to win. We're the people who are going to save this country. And we're going to do it one way. You know how that is? Together. We're going to do it together. And we all were able to do that big two breaths together, all right? All I'm gonna ask you is this. Commit your breaths, and I will make this commitment to you as well. Commit your breaths to achieving the ends that Fannie Mae Sellings gave her last four. And if you do that, if we all do that, we're gonna win. We're gonna win. Amen, brother. Thank you. that Todd said, none of us, none of us would be here today if it wasn't for Tony Slumkowski. Yeah. Tony started, I met Tony in 1979, he was on workers uh, comp, off with a back injury, and he slept in my local union hall for about a year at the local 1397. And, uh, uh, I like Tony, same reason I like Fanny Sellins. He was a rebel, and he was a militant, and he stood up for the working people, and he stood up and made sure that Fanny Sellins never, ever got a raise. He started this, I don't know if you know it or not, 1989. Tony started his little memorial service up at the gravesite. Do you realize how many years ago that was? No, come on. Yeah, just get your ambition right there. There were times when it was uh, there was times when it was as few as five or six of us up there, and Tony didn't give a shit. He was there every year, whether there was five people or whether there was fifty. And I love Tony, not just because he was an altar boy like I was when he was growing up. And not just because he slept at our union hall, but he was part of this local. And Todd will tell you, when they went out, they got locked out by this corporation here. I was up here on the picket lines every week during the freezing cold in January, February 2016. And I'm gonna tell you something. The United Steel Workers and the United Mine Workers need to take a page book out of what these brothers and sisters did up here because when I came up here to go on this picket line up here, there wasn't a store, there wasn't a pizza parlor, there wasn't anywhere in this town that didn't have a sign supporting the workers and supporting the uh, union and the lockout. The whole town backed them up. So I'd like to do this song and dedicate it to Todd, because Todd's my buddy. Uh, we, we did some things together. Yes, I love him, I love this local, and I'd like to also dedicate this song to my brother Ed Yankovich and the United Mine Workers. Yay! The song was written by Florence Reese, 1931, if you don't know who Florence Reese was. She was the wife of Sam Reese, who was an organizer for the United Mine Workers during the strike down in Harlan County. She wrote this song called Which Side Are You On? And please join me in the, uh, in the choruses. Which side are you on, brothers? Which side? 
like sheep, my friend, I stand up like women and men. Which side are you on, brothers? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, sisters? Which side are you on? When they locked out the workers here at eight. Thank Perry Brecker for playing taps. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. But I would like to ask, uh, while we gather the last few attendees that are walking in to participate in our program, we've been uh, through a this solemn occasion bro. today, a touching and a sentimental, as well as inspirational occasion and I would hope that uh, we could take a couple of minutes of silence, reflect on what you may have learned today, reflect on Flanny's role, what her murder meant, and how we might be able to use her energy, her inspiration, to make a difference while we remain on this earth. So if we could just engage in one or two minutes silence, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wherever little children are hungry and cry, wherever people ain't free, wherever men and women are fighting for their rights, that's where I'll be. That's where I'll be. So says Tom Joad, 
Woody Guthrie, and Fanny Mooney Sellens. Fanny, you were brutally murdered by the captains of industry with their hired thugs a hundred years ago and your body laid to rest at this site. But your spirit and mission live in our hearts today. This is why we gather here at your grave site to honor your sacrifice in the quest to build unions to win living wages and benefits and an eight hour day, health and safety conditions, an end to child labor, <coughs> public universal education, the weekend. Okay. We also gather here to remember, to remember our history so that we can teach our children and grandchildren and our co-workers about your courage, your bravery, and good soul. And to remind them that unless they, unless we remain vigilant, and I mean vigilant, we will once again be the victims of the robber barons and their hired vigilantes. United, we will not let this occur. Fanny Sellens, we gather here to say thank you. Thank you for standing up for us, your progeny, we, the representatives of the working class, are your heirs. We have directly benefited from your sacrifice and we want to recognize that you were viciously killed because you were standing up for justice and against injustice. You are barbarously murdered for fighting for men, women, children, families, community, and the right to have a union so that working men and women could live in dignity and enjoy respect. In appreciation for your life's work and to honor you in death, we pledge our solidarity with you and we pledge to continue to fight for your mandate to win liberty, justice, and equality for all. And I would ask that in that spirit, as a declaration of our pledge, I would ask that we stand and let us take each of our neighbors, our sisters, our brothers, hand and sing one chorus of solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We gather, O oh Lord, in prayer for honor and remembrance of beloved Fanny Sellens. Beloved Fanny was martyred in behalf and defense of coal miners. Her efforts in martyrdom are enriching. Her life was taken tragically. Her memory and life's work remain as lasting lessons. We pray that workers of every generation will draw inspiration from Fanny's life. She stood for the right and opposed to wrongs against working men and women. We are mindful of her efforts in behalf of minor Joseph Starzlisky, 
who tragically lost his life. Beloved family, Fanny was committed to the Union Way. O oh God, your love of those helping the suffering does not go unnoticed. Beloved Fanny's spirit and work live on and bear fruits even today. Give rest, O oh Lord, to beloved Fanny's soul. Enrich present and future coal miners and working people with her spirit. Thank you, O oh Lord, for Fanny's life and for blessing us with her life and lasting example. Grant rest eternal to fall asleep, O oh Lord, to the servant of God, Fanny and Joseph, and make their memory to be eternal. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Western Pennsylvania are so blessed to have such rich culture and musicians sing about our labor culture. Uh, Ann Feeney, God bless you. You and your Fanny's Chorus today, bless you. You've been for over 30 years, over 30 years, crusading throughout not only the United States of America, but the world on behalf of the working class. Thank you. I want to also thank Mike Stout. Mike, Mike Stout, who again has over 20 CDs with our message out to the world. And now we have Tom writing. Tom has written a song, especially for this occasion, yeah. entitled Fanny Sellens. And he also is traveling in all sorts of venues, uh, from schools to mine worker conventions. And we are so enriched by his uh, work on behalf of the working class. Thank you, Tom. In Pueblo, Colorado, Chicago, Illinois, and Wheeling, West Virginia, in New York, Lackawanna, Johnstown, PA, Cleveland, and Youngstown, Ohio, the steel strike of 19, a month before set, by September, it was strong, it was sound. And the blood-soaked picture in their union halls. Fanny Sellins, dead on the ground. She gave food to the starving, clothes to the babes. She brought children into this hard world. labor and capital, poisoned by greed, seeking only to comfort the many. But the steel trust gunmen fired on the line as the miners' children she gathered round. And now her blood-soaked picture is in the Union Hall. Fanny Sellins, dead on the ground. An angel of mercy, a guardian dear, a battle for freedom and love, committed her here, committed her here. not the day, forget not the fight, forget not the martyr who's fallen, forget not the union, the AFL, or the UMWA, forget not the bosses, the company thugs, or the reasons they gun Fanny down. Put her blood-soaked picture in your union hall. Fanny Sellins, dead on the ground.
Frank Snyder. Frank, God bless him, he travels every nook and cranny of Pennsylvania, all 67 counties, whether it's a picket line, a strike, a contract rally, an organizing rally, Frank Snyder is with us and cheering us on and encouraging us and supporting us. And today he's with us to represent all of labor throughout Pennsylvania. And we're honored to have him participate in this occasion. Thank Yay. you, Frank. Thank, Thank you. you. I am Frank Snyder, and on behalf of myself and our president, Rick Bloomingdale, and 700,000 hardworking women and men who make up our AFL-CIO in Pennsylvania, I certainly bring you greetings this evening, but all the appreciation that I can muster for you taking it upon yourselves to remember the life, the life of Ms. Fanny Sellins. Now, as I was driving across the turnpike from my office uh, earlier, just actually literally a, a little bit ago, and the clouds were pretty dark as they are on that side, and I was thinking about the verse, let justice uh, roll down like uh, a mighty river, and I'm thinking, please, Lord, let justice yeah, hold off for about go. a half yeah. an hour <laughs> when, when I get to Arnold, and, yeah, and then we yeah. can talk about it. But, but anyway, so while this marks the 100th anniversary of her shocking death, just as my good friend and yours, Rose, had talked about. It's really her life's work that we really ought to be coming here to remember. And I think that's exactly what you all have done. Uh, a century later, her life, not her death, her life serves as a profile in courage. It really, yeah. truly does. And perseverance, dignity, and justice. So I digress just a little bit. A few weeks ago, uh, as I often am in the Western Pennsylvania part in Pittsburgh, I'm reading in almost any paper I could pick up about another death of a person from that era, from this area, uh, and it marked the 100th anniversary of his death. And that was another person by the name of Andrew Carnegie. <laughs> now, now, <Toodaloo. laughs> the two could not have been more different. But then, Father, when I read every single article that I forced myself to read, it portrayed Carnegie almost in some type of religious exuberance. And I was really stunned. And if anyone had seen some of the articles and editorials that was written uh, about Carnegie, it really is fascinating. And that twisted reality comes from what I have to believe, the richest person at the time, in the twilight of his life, trying to erase his guilt-ridden conscience for the pain that he inflicted on so many and leaving libraries and music halls and colleges. I'm not sure if you've looked around where we are. I don't see any libraries or colleges or music halls out here. Now, just one more note. That 1892 homestead strike in Pennsylvania and the ensuing bloody battle that instigated the steel plant's management, for, it remains to this day another transformational moment in our history in America. And it still leaves scars. They're never really healed. As I said, there's no libraries and there's no music halls or colleges that commemorate the senseless massacre of innocent steel workers at Carnegie Steel or the brutal murder of an angel of mercy. A period every bit of turbulent 100 years ago as it is today. Think about the similarities. We saw vast changes in the economy. We saw vast changes in politics. And a society of the United States, while giving birth to a technological revolution that would profoundly alter the lives of all Americans 100 years ago. Doesn't that sound like it's happening again today? Mm -hmm. And what we had, a few called super rich, but most of us super poor. It was in fact a tale of two cities 100 years ago. It's really a tale of two cities today when you think about it. And you all know here, you men and women know the only thing that is standing in the way of that tale of two cities is what? Organized labor. 
the union movement is more important just as it was 100 years ago, as it was in its infant stages, as it is today. Now, my friend Rose always talks about them fighting us with bullets 100 years ago. And to be sure, they have fought us with extreme violence, exile, intimidation. 100 years later today, they're not using bullets, but they're still using fear and they're using <coughs> intimidation they're using all the tactics of psychological <coughs> warfare that are very real. Now, I want to just offer you up something because there's a path. There's a path to us regaining that power. And, and I hope that you'll take this back with you and think about something called PRO Act. And I think it's appropriate that I stand right here because I'm sure this is exactly what Fanny wants. That is to protect our right to Organize Act, PRO Act. It's a bill that's been introduced in Congress, House Bill 2474, and there's a Senate Companion Bill that's called 1306. That PRO Act, the Protect Our Right to Organize Act, is going to turn back the clock on Taft-Hartley, which is really when it all started to go okay. bad for us. While we were organizing, we tripled our union density whenever the National Labor Relations Act was passed in 1935, tested in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, where I was born in 1937, and the brave steelworkers, 10 of them who were fired at that point, remain a testament again to standing up and fighting for what you really believe in. So PRO Act is gonna be the law of the land. Not to get in political, but whoever you like, in Congress or for president, that has to be the test. You have to ask him or her, will they stand not, not behind you workers, not behind us workers, but beside you. Beside you and once and for all pass legislation that makes the right to work illegal in America. So regardless of your profession, I submit to you all that you know this well as anybody. There is dignity in all work. Okay. All needed to be treated with respect, with dignity, and a voice of the decisions that affect them. That's, right. That's exactly what Fanny Sellens gave her life for. Make no mistake about it. And rather than coming together to remember how she died, imagine when we gather again in the near future, and we really have meaningful labor law reform once and for all, we remember how she lived and how she laid that foundation for each and every one of us to enjoy the benefits of social and economic justice and a voice at work through our unions. Thank you so much, sisters and brothers. Make Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our next uh, invited uh, representative is from the Mine Workers, and it's my understanding that it's the first uh, woman officer of the United Mine Workers Union. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't have the pleasure of being Thank you. My name's Tanya James, and I'm the International Auditor Teller slash Executive Assistant to our Secretary Treasurer of the United Mine Workers. It's such an honor to be here. When I was asked to do this, I was so overwhelmed because this is so important, and it's so important to get what Fanny stood for out into the world because it's not known as well around the world as it is in this area. So. Uh, I started in the mines when I was 19 years old in 1979, and luckily it was a union mine, so I did have some protection from the company because it was union. And I was able to work underground for 24 years. Wow. And went to work for the United Mine Workers International as an organizer. And as a female organizer, I know how tough it is even now, and I can't even imagine what it was like back in their late 1800s and early 1900s, just how tough that had to be. But it was due to organizers like Fanny that uh, I was able to work all those years underground and belong to one of the greatest unions in the world, and that's the United Mine Workers. Mm -hmm. In the time period where she and Mother Jones were organizing, women weren't even, they were a bad omen to even go underground. It was bad luck for a woman to go underground, let alone try to organize a, a mine. 
So for a woman to have the guts and intellect to go out and persuade thousands of men to join a union was quite a feat. I mean, it was, it was quite a feat for a man, let alone a woman. And then when she heard uh, the women at the, in Chicago garment factory walked out, she headed to Chicago. Um, after her husband died, she herself was a garment worker. She raised four children on her own, uh, losing her only son in World War I. Um, but when she heard the women at the garment factory, she moved out there and became involved in the union movement. She helped organize the United Garment Workers of America and was known across the country for her fiery speeches as she collected money for strikers and called for boycotts of anti-union companies. When she was hired by the United Mine Workers, she was sent to non-union coal fields in West Virginia to organize and convince the miners to join the union. She was known among the workers as the Angel of Mercy, which we've heard here, for her part in taking care of not only the miners but and the steel workers, but their wives and especially their children. She felt it was her job to give clothing and food to starving women and children and help women bring their babies into the world, to minister to the sick and to close the eyes of the dying. A co-operator friendly judge had issued an anti-union injunction banning all union activities in Colliers, West Virginia, forbidding memberships in the union. At a mine rally in Colliers, Fanny defied the injunction and spoke out against the judge's effort to stifle free speech and the right to association. This is just some of the words she spoke at the rally. I am free and I have the right to walk or talk any place in this country as long as I obey the law. I've done nothing wrong. The only wrong they can say I've done is to take shoes to little children in Colliers who needed shoes. And when I think of their little bare feet, blue with the cruel blasts of winter, it makes me determine that if it be wrong to put shoes upon these little feet, then I will continue to do long, do wrong, I'm sorry, as long as I have hands and feet to crawl to colliers. That's the type of person she was. She was arrested and charged with inciting a riot and going against the judge's order. She served six months in the West Virginia jail just for defending this world's constitutional freedoms. And who knows how long she'd have been there if the mine workers hadn't put on a petition campaign and got Fanny pardoned by President Woodrow Wilson. After her pardon, she was sent to New Kensington, Pennsylvania's Allegheny Kiskey Valley, which is also known as the Black Valley because of the horrific violence of mine owners towards union organizers. Even though she knew how dangerous it was to organize in the Allegheny Valley, that didn't stop Fanny from getting thousands of miners and steel workers to join the union. She visited their homes, she talked with their wives, she took care of their sick, she made sure the immigrant miners were aware of and understood their rights. She inspired them to demand better pay and safer working conditions. Although the miners loved Fanny, the co-operators feared her and hated her and vowed to, in their words, get her, and they did. In 1919, Fanny was assigned to work with the miners who were striking in, <coughs> excuse me, against the Allegheny Coal and Coke Company in New Kensington. There's a few different accounts of Fanny's murder. One of those accounts, I hate talking about this part. One of those accounts was that Fanny, along with a group of women and children, were visiting a friend who was a miner at his house near a picket line it was told that they heard a ruckus outside and went out to see what was happening. When Fanny saw the deputies, the mine guards had rushed to picketing miners and shot Joseph Starzelski, I can't say his name, excuse me. <laughs> and were still beating on him. She intervened by throwing herself on Joseph, shielding him from the attackers and all the while pleading with them to stop. It was then that the deputies and guards saw their opportunity to get her and turned their drunken rage towards her. Fanny fled into the miner's backyard, which was off mine property, with her attackers in chase. She was shot, then bashed in the forehead so hard that it left a depressed, depressed fracture from the top of her eye to her right ear. Can you imagine your skull crushed in from here through to here? Then rolled over and shot again, and this time in the face. 
Another account was that Fanny was scolding and swearing at the deputies when they turned on her. And some say she was trying to protect a group of women and children. Regardless of how things played out that night, Fanny Sellings was brutally murdered in cold blood in front of innocent, horrified eyes of women and children by a bunch of drunken thugs who were hired by the Allegheny Coal and Coke Company. No respect was shown to Fanny even in death. They dragged her lifeless body by her heels to a vehicle and tossed her along with the body of Joseph in the back like two bags of garbage. They then mocked her by dancing around wearing her hat shouting, now I'm Fanny Sellins. Only two deputies were arrested and tried for the murders, but at the coroner's inquest, the jury ruled her death was a justifiable homicide and blamed Fanny for starting a riot which had led to her death. The union and Fanny's, Fanny's family raised money to hire a lawyer to push a criminal investigation and pressure, pressure officials in to, to reopen the case. A grand jury in Pittsburgh indicted three deputies for the killings, but a trial in 1923 ended in an acquittal for two of the men, and the third man, who was the actual gunman, didn't appear for his trial and was never seen again. Fanny's life seems like it was ripped straight out of the pages of the story of Mother Jones, with one major exception. Mother Jones lived through her battle with the coal companies. Fanny did not. Her precious life was taken from her and her family at a young age of 47 years. Although some call her a martyr, I think of her as a heroine who literally laid her life on the line to try and save another life of a human being. And by dying that horrible death that night, she opened the eyes and hearts of thousands of men and women and gave them the courage to fight for their rights. And here we are, 100 years later, 100 years later still fighting the same battles that Fanny did and more. So rest in peace, my sister. Although you didn't receive the worldwide fame as that of Mother Jones, your legacy will always live deeply in the hearts of all coal miners and steel workers. And we will make sure the world doesn't forget the sacrifice you made that, so that we could live a better life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Oh, Dana James, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Our next, uh, Speaker is an old friend, a mentor, a comrade, an organizer who uh, the two of us have been able to uh, raise a ruckus in Greene County and Fayette County and Allegheny County and all of Western Pennsylvania together for many years. And, and I just can't tell you uh, what deep respect that I have for the uh, retired Vice President of the United Mine Workers, Ed Yankovic. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for that very kind introduction. And uh, my sister Tanya, it was just a wonderful, wonderful talking to you yeah. here today. I saw many friends, old friends here today. Charlie, well, you guess it's all right. my brother Nick, who served with together many years. Casey Malouli, a young man who's now working for our union, and Frank and Father Torbeck, an honorary member of my local. Local 1980. But, you know, there's much been said about the life of Fanny Sullins, and that's true. We should consider, quite frankly, how she lived, what she lived for, what she did. But there's something else we also all need to remember. Just going to give you some facts. And September 10th in 1897. 250 mine workers left the village of Harwood near Hazleton, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their numbers grew to 400. They were going to Latimer. They were all Polish and Slovak and Lithuanian descent. And before they got to Latimer at the gates, 19 of them were shot and killed and 38 others wounded by Luzerne County Sheriff's deputies. On April 20th, 1914, the Colorado National Guard, which was paid for by John Rockefeller at that time, used machine guns to kill 21 people in Ludlow, Colorado. Now, of those 21, two women and 11 children died 
in the bottom of a dugout beneath a, a tent that caught on fire. There's many things. The anthracite strike of 1902. All the labor struggles that we had. The Pink Creek and Cabin Creek Wars. The Battle of Blair Mountain. The Homestead Strike. Fanny Sellens and Joe Strozelski's death. What, what, there's something in common here. And I don't know if anybody ever taken account or thought about that. Over all those struggles and over all those deaths that took place to stand up for workers, people who were murdered, people who clearly were murdered, not one person went to jail for that. Not one person. And I'm telling you something right now. It's, it, this was bigger, and it's still bigger today than the labor movement. You understand, most of these folks that we're talking about were immigrants. First generation Americans who came to here from other countries. And I'm telling you right now, if it wasn't for the invention of this right here, that you could take pictures very easily with, there would be people from Guatemala, Honduras, and all those other countries killed the same way. They would be killed and murdered the same way. So, I, I, here's what it is. I mean, the only people who are going to stop this, the only people who are going to stand up for this, like Frank said, is the labor movement. And we're going to stand up and we're going to continue to fight. We're going to continue to be activists. No matter how old we are, no matter how young we are. It's one thing said about a United Mine Worker. You're a mine worker from cradle to grave. From cradle to grave. And I know I'll do my part. I'll try my best. And I know there's everybody standing here. If you're here today, that means that's what your pledge is, or you wouldn't be here today. That's right. You wouldn't be here today. And those, those people, here's what angers me now, and here's what that we got to stand up for. Those people who are talking about immigrants and they don't have a right in our society, we need to challenge that. They have every right, like my grandparents had this right to come here. Yeah, that's right. They had this right to come here. Yeah. And don't tell me it was legal back then because it wasn't legal. It was just convenient for H.C. Frick Coal and Coke Company for them to be here. That's right. That's where it was. It was convenient. So Fanny Sellens got murdered along with Joe that day, a hundred years ago today, because she stood up for workers' rights, but not only for workers' rights, for immigrants' rights as well. And we gotta put that as part of our message. It's not just about being in a union, it's about being a human being, because that's the union we belong to, the human race. And once we realize, understand that this is our union, the human race, and we're all together, then, then at that point, her death and Joe's death and all those other ones, counting us numbers, will mean something. Because that was what changed the tide and made us a better human beings. Yeah. And so with that, I just want to thank everybody who asked me to come here to speak. It's a great honor. I, you know, I'm retired now, but uh, this is very near and dear to me. Or just one more thing I had to say. I, I, I just think back and uh, my dad hated the company. In 1933, my grandfather was on strike. They lived in a tent. My dad was only nine years old. He had an older brother, Tommy, who was 10, who died of pneumonia. Because they lived in a tent and they didn't have heat. Okay. 
Don't ever think that couldn't happen again. Because it happens down on the border to immigrants there. Right. It happens now. As we sit here today, it happens now. So God bless you. God bless Fanny. And may the union live on forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She goes to our president of local 1196, Todd, and thank you for your hospitality, the wonderful work that you did, including all these wonderful chairs. And I mean, truly, I mean, uh, you and Pam are the best, and in, and in the meaning of family, of the union, brothers and sisters, you're truly my brother. Thank, thank you, you so sure. much. Thank, thank you. Hey, I just want to thank everybody for uh, being part of this presentation. Uh, this whole day was like a long day, but it was full of a, a lot of laughter, a lot of memory, but a lot of um, strong emotion. So um, I can't think of a better way to, uh, to close out the, the uh, presentation, but I'd ask everybody if they could please bow their head and, and pray, please. Well, I just came across Fanny by accident, and when I read about how she was killed and no one ever had to pay for her death, no one was ever convicted, and it was really that quote that that got me, the quote about her not doing anything wrong except giving shoes to poor children whose feet were cold and blue from the cruel blasts of winter. I mean, I, that just went right to my heart that she was such a woman of compassion and courage and I just thought everyone should know about her and I couldn't believe that there were no books about her so that's good <laughs> I wrote the book actually very quickly. I wrote the book very quickly. It, although I did, it, I did keep coming up with new information after years and years just digging and digging. But it was hard to find someone to publish it because she wasn't famous. They want a book right on someone who's already famous. So I, uh, it took me 10 years before I found a publisher who wanted to publish it.
she not there to stand 